Alan isn't because we we have a lot in common, Warner and Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative. We're all concerned about how we can have a Cincinnati where everyone, we want an economy that benefits all. And there have been all kinds of people that have been kept out of our economy and we're trying to figure out ways to push through those barriers and really create an economy that works for all. So I'm sorry he's not here, but I hope he'll be at another one so you can hear what Warner's up to because they rock. Their website's pretty good though, so if you haven't had a chance to meet them, that would be a good place to get started. Um, so what, so I think, you know, it's interesting because you talked about co-ops being a new idea, and they really aren't a new idea. Um, so I just wonder, do you guys know how many co-ops there are in the United States right now? Just guess. 10,000. Higher? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking just worker-owned co-ops, I'm talking every kind of co-op. Housing co-ops also? Housing co-ops, I'm talking purchasing co-ops, consumer co-ops, producer co-ops. I'll tell you what all those are in a second. Um, in addition. 39,000. Ooh, so close. So 29,000. So there's 29,000. They account for 2 million um, in the sense of the amount of people that are employed through those co-ops. And they have 3 trillion in assets. And when you look at the members of those co-ops, there's actually 350 million members. Which is really amazing because we don't, I don't think, I think our population in the United States is 330 million. So what it is is that people have multiple, they are part of, you know, numerous ones. And those numbers are really impressive, but where they are not impressive is when it comes to worker-owned co-ops. And that's what's kind of newer for us. Um, but what I want to say is, so what are all these co-ops that I'm talking about? We have things, how many people in here are part of a credit union? Okay, right, so credit unions are co-ops. It's one member, one vote. And that's really what a co-op is. It's a group of people that have come together to meet a specific goal or fulfill a need, and they're democratically run. So it's one member, one vote. And the, who the member is depends on what kind of co-op it is. So for credit unions, those are called consumer co-ops, is the people using the services that are the members. And then, how many of you are part of REI? Or do you know that store that um, it's an outdoor equipment store? That's also a consumer-owned co-op. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. It's cool. So, <laughs> so those are consumer-owned co-ops. Co co are by far the majority of co-ops. Um, but then there's producer co-ops. How many of you have heard of Organic Valley, <coughs> Land of Lakes? Ocean Spray. Um, these are co-ops that are Cabot Creamery. These are co-ops that are owned by the producers, the agricultural workers, the owner, the farmers, etc. cetera. Um, and they come together, and that's what those ones are. Now, the interesting thing, though, about these is that they're not, they're not owned. So Cabot Creamery, when we think about that, we think about the cheese that we get from them or some of those value-added products. The workers that produce those are not part of the co-op. So the people who are part of the co-op are the farmers. Um, so the, so it's, it's the people that are supplying um, the, the raw milk, all of that kind of stuff, the raw ingredients. So the workers are kind of left out in that particular situation, which is something just to be thinking about. And then Ace Hardware, another co-op, purchasing co-op. So what it is, is all the Ace Hardwares kind of own the central, so they want to be able to compete with Home Depot. They want to be able to compete with Lowe's. And how do you do that? You own um, the central distributor so that you can purchase together. So you're purchasing the same amount that Home Depots are purchasing, because you've got all these Ace Hardwares across the United States. You can finally like buy um, and get that benefit of scale. So that's another form of co-ops. And co-ops have been really integral in the formation of our country. And something, you know, because there's all these places where the market fails. So if you think of something like the electrification of our country, that wouldn't have happened without co-ops. There's things called rural electric co-ops that are absolutely critical. It didn't make business sense for companies such as Duke and huge utilities 
to electrify these rural areas that had few people living in them. It didn't make sense, but obviously they needed electricity, and so the people living there banded together to get their need met where the market failed and invest and build their own um, electrification. So this has happened again and again, and excitingly, if you want to hear more about this history, there's this woman named Jessica gordon Nebhard. She's coming to Xavier. Uh, she's, um, she's in the Cooperative Hall of Fame, and she's um, from CUNY, that City University of New York, and she's written a book called Collective Courage, which details actually the African American experience with cooperatives since the time of slavery, because they've been an important vehicle when the whole group has been segregated and kept out of financial systems, creating credit unions, for example, creating these kinds of services that were being completely, or that were completely unavailable, or at least had limited availability. She is an awesome speaker. I've heard her multiple times. She'll be at the Centos Center at 7 o'clock on April 21st, and we will all learn a lot if we are there. But it is, it's, she's, it's gonna be really, really awesome. And the very next day, if you're super interested, there's actually a whole day on co-ops. It's a whole conference. I'll be leading one of the workshops on how you actually create a co-op. Other people are leading them. She's leading one because she's worked with this group in Puerto Rico that's actually been creating co-ops within their prison structure. So these are, so it's, it's really amazing. These are actual inmates currently incarcerated that have been able to create co-ops. And it's a very powerful story. She'll be sharing that that next day. So now I feel like I'm giving an ad, but I more want you to just know because it's, it's a really neat opportunity. And it's exciting that this wonderful old woman will be joining us and kind of helping us understand the power of cooperatives. Yeah? I, I perceive that the co-ops uh, don't advertise themselves as such. Yeah. Uh, I've been to Ace Hardware stores from here to Redbud, Illinois. Yes. <laughs> and had no idea that they were part of the co-op system. Yeah, I agree with you. What and is including REI up here at uh, Norwood. I agree. I think these various co-op systems do not advertise themselves very much, which is why I actually decided to spend some time, because I think we're, it's kind of an invisible but forceful part of our economy, and it's kind of, it's important to know about it. But the part of it that I'm really going to focus on today I haven't yet talked about, which is worker-owned co-ops. So now remember we talked about 29,000 co-ops in the U.S.? Guess how many of those are worker-owned? Any number? 2,000. Less. <laughs> 1,000. Less. <laughs> 350. Oh my gosh! That might be the exact number, but it's like right around there. If it's not 350, it's between 350 and 400. And these co-ops, these worker-owned co-ops, account for about 7,000 people uh, in the workforce. So it's a small part of our, very super small part of our economy. Like, so that's what it's like here in the US. But that's not what it's like in other parts of the world. And what excited us, the Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative, is this example called Mondragon. Have you heard of Mondragon? Some of you have. You have heard me speak many times, and so have you. Some of you have, but I will tell you for those that don't know. So what Mondragon is, is the world's um, most successful network of industrial co-ops. And they're in the Basque region of Spain. They've been around for 60 years. And when they started in the 50s in this area of Spain, it was completely decimated. After the Spanish Civil War, the infrastructure was a mess. There was over 50% of the population living in poverty, being unemployed. And this integrated network of co-ops, so this group of, this is, I mean, there's all kinds of things that happened. There was a really remarkable priest that came in, um, started to help people get more connected, started a cooperative school focused on um, cooperative education and also technical skills. And five of those first graduates began a kerosene stove cooperative. So it was just five people initially in this building kerosene stoves. 
And from there, within about 20 to 25 years, they had nearly full employment in this particular area. So amazing. And now, when you're about 60 years into this, they have over 70,000 people employed in a network of over 100 cooperatives. Um, so it's pretty awesome. When Spain has a unemployment rate of 27%, this area has 4%. It's really resilient. And the question is, how did they do that? It's not just there, too. There's an incredible cooperative economy in parts of Italy that is flourishing. There's incredible cooperative economies in Quebec and in many other places. But today, we'll just focus on Mondragon, which is the one I know the most about. Um, so what led to that incredible sea change? And that, of course, is what we want here. We want a Cincinnati with full employment. We want a Cincinnati that, you know, Cincinnati currently has one of the highest childhood poverty rates in our country. It's absolutely horrific. What can be an, what can really deeply change that on a systemic level? That's what we want to see. We want to do what they did there. Um, and the question is, can what they do there, is what happened in the Basque region of Spain, is that something that can be transplanted and occur here in a place with an entirely different culture? And that's been a question for a long time. Some people in this room are connected with the Inner Community Justice and Peace Center, where I worked for 12 years. And at IJPC, we sent people to Mondragon in the 80s and the 90s and said, this is amazing, this is what we want, but can this be translated here? And the thinking at that time was probably not because the culture is so different. So a very solidarity-minded culture. So when thinking about, for example, this in the Basque region of Spain, when thinking about, um, you know, it's like thinking about how can the whole community thrive? That's kind of more the mentality. And when we come to the United States, we're thinking more about the American dream, the majority.